we're going to be thinking for the next 15 minutes about some kind of basics to do with Bible interpretation. Um, Sean just spoke about the difference between eisegesis and exegesis. And by the way, can I just say, as Sean was speaking about all these big um, sermon words, I was quite jealous of his American accent. I think somehow, when you say expository, it sounds so much better than expository. Um, so I'm glad that Sean's... I, I'm a Sean sandwich this evening, so it's Sean, then me, and then Sean again. So we get his American dulcet tones back in a bit. He's talking about eisegesis and exegesis. Exegesis... Um, being trying to interpret the text that you have in front of you. Um, and that's what I, where I want to start this evening, is, is really our responsibility as preachers to do that and how we can begin to try and do that faithfully. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, uh, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth one who correctly handles the word of truth. And I think every time we get up into the pulpit, we do have a responsibility to do as best we can, and clearly we are fallen and imperfect and won't get it right perfectly, but to try and be one who correctly handles the word of truth. And I think we will do that better uh, if we can try and um, understand some basics of biblical interpretation. Um, I'm aware that we've got a range of people, and so for some people, this, and maybe for most of you, this will be incredibly basic, um, and I hope you don't feel patronised, um, and, and for others, maybe it will be helpful. Um, let, me, let me go through it. This is this more colourful one, uh, if, you're, if you're following on your notes. Um, on that first side, a few things to bear in mind. I've said, know where you are. So this book here is huge. And we get a small bit of it to preach on on a Sunday. Um, and it is very helpful, just as if you were on a big journey in an unfamiliar territory, to have a map in front of you and to know where you are on the map. Um, and so I've, I've, I've talked about knowing where you are on maps and libraries. So two images for you. One is a map. And that is when you open up your Bible and you turn to a particular book or letter or text of some kind, uh, it is helpful to know where you are on, if you like, the biblical map. And I don't mean that literally in terms of this was situated in Palestine in the first century or whatever. I mean, think about the overall uh, narrative arc of, this, of Scripture. Where is this text in place of the whole story of the Bible? Um, and that little illustration there that I've put down, that colourful one, is a very um, uh, well-known one. I think it comes from a chap called... Graham Goldsworthy, who did a Bible overview um, back in the 80s, I think it was, um, and really helpfully through the kind of the story of the kingdom um, traces the big plot line of the Bible. That's one of, of five or ten, or probably more that I'm not aware of, ways of tracing the big storyline of the Bible. And it's very helpful when you sit down with a text to just to have an idea as to where am I, where am I roughly in the big storyline of the Bible, because that probably guards against me going completely against the grain of the Bible story. If I'm interpreting the text and it seems to run contrary to the overall narrative of the whole of Scripture, well, that's a flag immediately. So know where I am on the kind of the big narrative arc. Um, I've just put down there that um, if, these, these kind of Bible overviews are like um, different pictures of an amazing mountain range taken from different angles. So if you've seen, if you've read one particular Bible overview, um, and that's like, that's like kind of looking at the mountains that way, and then you come across another Bible overview, which, which shows you another way of kind of weaving the story through, that's like a picture of the mountain range from a different angle. Um, so I think it's helpful to have a few in mind. But there is one which is really helpful for you. Um, the pattern of the kingdom, the perished kingdom, the promised kingdom, the partial kingdom, uh, the prophesied kingdom, the present kingdom, the proclaimed kingdom, uh, and the perfected kingdom. Um, that is a helpful way of just understanding something of the Bible story. So know where you are, that's maps. Um, and then libraries. You will know that this, that this book is in fact a collection of 66 books. It is a library and therefore as with all libraries it has um, a wide variety of types of literature and knowing which section of the library we are in is very helpful again to just not make any false starts as to how we begin interpreting it. So I've got, uh, I could have three bits of writing from my wife 
Um, <laughs> uh, one might be a shopping list, another might be a lovely um, card on Valentine's Day. I haven't got any of those, actually. Um, and, and another might be some instructions as to how to, how to work, I don't know, some piece of machinery. Um, they are all going to be from my wife. They're all going to be useful to me. But I need to understand the type of literature I'm writing so I don't kind of massively misinterpret what she means when she's giving me some instructions about, uh, I don't know, a piece, of, a piece of machinery, or I don't think that she's trying to kind of be particularly affectionate with talking about pears and apples or something. I need to know what literature I'm reading so that I interpret it correctly. Uh, and it's, I'm going to apply it to my life differently according to the type of literature it is. Just in passing, though, it is also interesting to note that because of my relationship with my wife, all of those bits of information, those different texts, those different literature or genres, will be conveying, if you like, love in some sense to me, because I have an existing relationship with my wife. And I think the same is true of scripture, that we have different texts and massively different literature, and some of it doesn't seem very loving. It might seem more like a shopping list or something else. But behind it, there is a loving God who is conveying something to me which, when I can work out what it is, uh, will help me understand something of his love towards me. It's a relational thing as we interpret scripture, and I think that's important to bear in mind as well. So that's maps and libraries, and I've put there genres matter. Um, just briefly, um, and again, this is very basic stuff, I've put there in a box at the bottom. It is worth remembering that, of course, when we pick up our English Bibles, most of us, unless you are better than me at languages, most of us will be using an English text for our Bible, uh, Bible um, study. Um, of course, it wasn't written in, originally in English. Most of the, uh, the Old Testament was Hebrew with a bit of Aramaic and uh, the New Testament in um, Koine Greek. Uh, and so even just that process of translation is important to bear in mind as we come to it. And that's where commentaries can be very helpful, sometimes just showing us uh, the different kind of original uh, meanings of original words. Um, of course, it was written over a period of 1,000 years or 1,600 years, perhaps two to 3,000 years ago. Uh, and again, that leap in difference between that culture then or those cultures then and our culture now needs to be taken into account as we, as we interpret scripture. Um, so uh, actually, I nicked this, this phrase from Sean from some material he sent me. I think it is helpful as a summary on all of that stuff to trust what you have in front of you. So we pick up the Bible and we know that it's the word of God. We don't need to, we don't need to kind of panic about it. Trust what you have in front of you. The, these manuscripts, these translations are good and reliable, um, but also know how to dig deeper. So maybe um, know, uh, have some trusted commentaries that you can borrow or some trusted resources online that can help you if you get to something you think, I'm not quite sure. Um, that's helpful as well. Um, brilliant. So, what I'd like you to have in front of you now is both the, 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 the other side of what I've just talked about, which says three texts, and then also this, which is, um, you probably can't read half of it because it's my scribbles, um, which is something a, a little bit like what I would do just as I begin a sermon preparation, trying to put into, into practice some of what I'm about to say about um, the biblical text and how we go about trying to interpret it um, and the various questions we ask of it. Um, Tim Keller, who wrote this book, which I commend to you, um, uh, helpfully called Preaching. Um, if, you, if you want a really, really helpful book, um, which is obviously a fair, a fair read, decent width, um, Preaching by Tim Keller is very good. He talks in this book about the three texts of the sermon, uh, the first being uh, the biblical text, the second being the context um, that you are preaching into, and the third being the subtext. And I'll say something very briefly if I have time about those, uh, those last two, context and subtext, but we'll focus on biblical text. Uh, when we come to the biblical text in front of us, if we're trying to do what Sean was um, helping us to see and uh, try and think about exegesis rather than eisegesis, I think there are some very helpful questions we can ask of the text in front of us. And I've put down where, what, why, how, and what again. Um, it doesn't matter particularly which order you do them in. Um, but here are some, here are some helpful um, questions. You can see that I've done this as a kind of example with Matthew 5, 17 to 20. This was a text I preached about three weeks ago. Um, so it was fresh in my mind. And these, these were questions that I was asking of the text as I prepared that sermon a few weeks ago. So where is this text? Um, that is what I was talking about before. Where is it in the, in the scope of the whole Bible? Um, 
Where is it? Is it in the Old Testament? Is it in the New Testament? Where is it within this particular book or letter or psalm that I'm doing? What, where, where is it? Um, and, you can see, and you can see what I've begun to scribble down there. Where is it? Well, it's in the New Testament. It's in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, there we go. Uh, that's the first question I might ask of it. Um, the second question... Actually, I, I've, I'm going to say something else there. Ah, oh, yes. Well, the reason it's helpful to ask where it is, okay, both in terms of where is it in the, in the overall narrative and also where is it within the context of the book, is because that is a very helpful question to begin, us, uh, begin to help us understand something of what the original author's intention was. Um, and if you remember, Sean was saying earlier, we want to try and understand what does the person who wrote this, what were they trying to convey? Um, that is a helpful, that's a really important question to try and wrestle with. Uh, what, was the, what was the intent of the original author? So where is it? What type of literature are we dealing with? Is this a shopping list? Is it a love letter? Is it advice, etc.? Um, really important question, why is this bit of the Bible here? Um, why is this bit of the Bible here? If all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training and righteousness, I take it every sentence in scripture has a purpose. There is a reason it is there. It has something to teach us. Um, and so when I, when I look at a section of, of scripture that I'm preparing to preach, I say, why is this here? And that gets to the question of what is, what is the main idea? What is it that God is trying to speak to his people through this particular passage? Sometimes that's much easier with certain passages than others. Um, so you can see my attempt at summarising why this is here on, from Matthew 17 to 20. I've tried to summarise something of what this, what this is saying. Jesus completes the Old Testament, uh, Old Testament righteousness and calls his followers to heart deep obedience. That was my attempt at summarising a kind of big idea of this text. As I kind of read through it five or ten times and really tried to pray and reflect on it. Why is it here? Well, I think it's teaching us that. It's probably teaching us some other things as well. But if we can try and get the main idea from it, it will really help. Um, one or two sentences just distilling that main thrust. How is it conveyed? Um, and Sean mentioned this a bit as well earlier. Um, texts aren't written into a vacuum. They are from people to people. And usually, either very obviously or in some kind of subtext, behind the scenes, if you like, or between the lines, there will be emotion involved. And so the way that this particular... Um, text is, or a particular message is being conveyed is very important to try and wrestle with as a preacher because that will, will shape the way that I shape my sermon. So I not only want to try and preach the message or the big idea of this text, I also want to try and convey the emotion of this text. Um, and I think that is really important because we, we were talking just now about what the kind of aim of preaching is. Someone has described the aim of preaching as capturing the... the, the um, affections of the hearts of your listeners for Jesus. It's showing them the loveliness of Jesus. And one way that we do that is to show what, what um, show the, the, the kind of um, emotive nature of the text that you have in front of you. If there's anger, then there may be a certain amount of anger in the way that, not the way that you shout at people, but in the force with which you, you share this message. If there is joy, then it, then it will show on your face. Um, if there is anguish, etc. So try and identify what emotion there may be here. And then finally, what light does this particular text shed on Jesus and the gospel? So does this, te does this particular text show us something new or different about Jesus and the good news of Jesus? Or alternatively, what light does Jesus or the gospel shed on this text? Um, and that can help you understand, particularly when we come to the Old Testament, that's a really important question to ask. What light does Jesus shed on this text to help me understand it better? Um, I think those are helpful uh, questions to ask. I've got all sorts of other notes that I've scribbled along here. I'm just trying to see if I've uh, missed anything out. No, I don't think there is. Um, that might be, that th this, this example might be helpful for you to peruse through at some point, just to kind of see how you can begin to answer those questions. Um, and actually, on the back, in a few moments, you're going to have a go at doing it yourself with a different text from John uh, chapter 20. Um, you can either do it on your own or, or together, if you like. Um, what time did I start, Sean? We're good. Yeah. Shall I carry on for five minutes? Great. In which case, just very briefly, that's the biblical text. 
Um, know where you are, all of that stuff, those big questions to ask of the text. And then briefly thinking about context. And I think this is how, when we begin to think about how do I bring this text from the Bible to the hearts, minds, and lives of the people in front of me? What is the context that I'm preaching into? found this quotation extremely helpful from Keller. You can see this uh, on your sheet. This understanding of preaching, that's contextual communication, this understanding of preaching is one aspect of what missiologists call contextualization. It means to resonate with, yet defy, the culture around you. It means to antagonize a society's idols while showing respect for its people and many of its hopes and aspirations. It means expressing the gospel in a way that is not only comprehensible, but also convincing. I think that bears some reflection. Um, so as we come to preach a text, we're not only just trying to explain what Paul says to Timothy here, or whatever text it is, but we're trying to speak this truth that we believe God has revealed to us and has taught us by his spirit to this particular context. So where does this truth speak into the idols of this particular culture? Where does it affirm what this culture thinks is good? Or where does it say what you, what you hope for is really good, but actually you're, you're, you're only seeing it partially fulfilled in a way you're trying to, trying to fulfill it. What you need is the gospel of Jesus. Can you, see, can you see how you begin to try and speak this text into this particular context? I hope that makes some sense. Um, there's a, there's a very helpful uh, list of um, do's there for, for contextual preaching. Uh, that he's, he's got a whole section on each of these, but um, helpful to consider as we're speaking into a particular context, trying to use accessible vocabulary, demonstrating an understanding of doubts and objections. I think that's really important in today's culture. So when we, if, if you wrestle with something in the message of this text, you can guarantee that other people will. Um, and it's important to bring those into the light and say, well, as we read this text, oh, Claire's got a question. Well, accessible vocabulary. What's a missiologist? Missiologist, just someone who studies mission, how we, how we go about sharing the gospel. Sorry. Um, so a really, I think a really effective way of preach, speaking into the, to the context you're speaking is, is trying to anticipate the objections, yes, of, of non-Christians that may be in your church situation, but also of the, of, of the average person sitting in the pew. As I, as I hear this, as I pick up this bit of the Bible, what am I immediately going to be thinking? Am I going to be on the back foot because of our cultural assum culture's assumptions? Well, let's bring that, bring that out into the light and speak into it uh, and show how this truth begins to speak into that. Um, employ culturally respected authorities, uh, if we have any left. Um, affirm in order to challenge baseline cultural narratives. That was a very cynical comment, I'm sorry. Um, I... I there's, there's, lots, there's lots in there that I haven't got time to go into. Um, I'm happy to, to talk through more with you, uh, some of those, some of those um, things from Tim Keller, um, or you could read the book and he'd do an even better job at explaining it. Um, essentially, it's trying to bring the message of the gospel, the good news, into the culture and the context that we're speaking into, um, which I think is vital, um, absolutely vital. And finally, the subtext, uh, and we'll think more about this in the rest of the course, I think, as we th think about our own lives. Um, but we, we will all, there will be a subtext as we preach that people observe in us. So I might be able to explain the text very well. I might even be able to speak into the context very well. But if, let's say, I don't really believe what I'm preaching, my body language and the way that I kind of talk about it probably won't convince you. Um, and you might not even know why you don't quite trust this preacher, but it may be the subtext of my heart um, that is speaking unbeknownst to me. It's the subtext between, it's, 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 it's what I communicate uh, invisibly to me, but you pick it up. Does that make sense? Um, and that speaks to the importance of our hearts as preachers, and we'll, we'll think about that and we rely on the Holy Spirit and, uh, as we go on in the course. Excellent. That's me done. Um, what I'm going to suggest for the next 10 or 15 minutes is you can do one or two things. You can do as I've suggested and ask those questions of the biblical text that I've put there, which is John 20, the end of John's Gospel. Um, or you may just want to chew over some of the stuff. Uh, you, might want to, you might want to think through some of the um, questions. Maybe you've got some additional questions that you ask of the text that are helpful to share with the group. Um, do what you wish. Thanks very much. <laughs>